out because you're going to make us come in last. You're slowing us down. Today, Polly flames out on the challenge, and Ashley explains what went wrong. We have to make up time. The Brits are ahead of us. Shut up and do work. Plus, the legendary Paul Schaefer tells us all about his time as a masked singer. When this thing is seen, I don't know what's going to happen to my reputation. This is your reality check. Buckets, bro. Buckets. All day. Welcome to the show. I'm so excited to be here today. I'm Darren Karp, and with me is People.com writer and reporter, Emma Powell, Dave Quinn. Hey! How are you, Dave? I'm so good. I am so happy to be here as well. Happy Thursday. I know. It's like the end of the week, basically. I cannot wait. What are you doing this weekend? I have to work. Oh, I know. Are you doing that anything fun? I mean, I was going to hang out with you, but not anymore. You want to come to work with me? No, part well, pass. <laughs> let's get to work. Let's get into our top five. At number five... Happy birthday, Saint! Kim Kardashian West and Kanye West's older son turned four on Thursday, and the first person to send well wishes was none other than his proud grandmother, Kris Jenner. She captioned a series of posts shared to her Instagram, quote, I can hardly believe you're four years old. You are growing up so fast. You bring such joy to everyone around you. Mommy Kim also shared a sweet photo to Twitter with a heartfelt note saying, Quote, I have no words to describe how much I love your smile. You bring so much joy into my soul. I'm so happy we get to celebrate how much you've grown. Oh. Dave, I'm so excited to see how much you've grown, but not as much <laughs> as Saints, let me he tell you. so absolutely adorable. He's like, perfect. But he's it, super duper cute. He comes, we're at the age now where it's like, I remember his birth so well, yeah. and I'm like, oh no. <laughs> no, we're getting older. old because we can count our years in Saints years, but look at, yes. look at that. He's so That cute. is adorable. Greatest hair in the game with the I cross know. and the shirt open. I will say this, a, a lot of people knock the Kardashians, they make adorable babies. Those well, babies are all real cute. I, I, that's, I can't argue with that. <laughs> at number four, Nikki, Bella, and boyfriend Artem just took a big step in their relationship. On Wednesday's episode of the Total Bellas podcast, the reality star revealed that she recently met her boyfriend's parents, admitting that she was really nervous for the milestone moment. She explained that it was the first time the Dancing with the Stars alum saw his family in five years. So he was nervous and excited and emotional. The former WWE wrestler went on to explain that her nerves stem from wanting to give an amazing first impression and navigating a language barrier as his parents don't speak English. Ooh, that's hard. That's really, I mean, listen, it's always nerve wracking meeting the parents, but yeah. when he he hasn't seen them forever and a language barrier. Right. It's a whole level of complication. How do you navigate meeting the parents? Is that like a, it's a milestone in any relationship. My personality right? speaks for itself, exactly. Dave. You think that you I'm nervous? Worry. I'm great with the parents. <laughs> Are you kidding? I'm like a 75 year old woman in a 31 year old body. They love me. See, and my boyfriend's parents don't speak English, so I have to navigate that. So what a do you do? I, I mean, I'm learning Greek. I'm doing the best I can. Are you learning Greek? Yeah. Good. See, I only know the bad words, and that was Spanish. See? They'll probably be impressed with you. Yeah, right. They'll be impressed with you. No way. Uh, at number three, Andy Cohen is speaking out about Trump's latest federal judge nominee. During his Jack Hole of the Day segment on Watch What Happens Live with Andy Cohen, the host shared his outrage about the appointment of Sarah Pitlick, who was confirmed by the Senate on Tuesday. The Bravo exec says she spent the bulk of her career aggressively going after the rights of people to use fertility treatments and surrogacy, meaning if you are one of the millions of couples who are struggling to conceive or have turned to surrogacy to start a family like I did to have been, you totally screwed on this woman's watch. Cohen went on to point out that Pitlick Pitlick has a lack of trial experience and has never tried a case before her confirmation. Ugh. Couldn't agree more with my boss. Yeah, I have to say, I mean, he posted this last night right after the show on uh, social media yeah. explaining that he is enraged. I felt that enragement from the other end of the Well, you can see television. with his pointing, that's how you know he's... Is that how you know? That's how you know he's real. Oh, has he done that to you before? No, me? No. <laughs> this face? No. I want to know the real secrets. But I But agree. I'll say this. Like, I, I'm so grateful for him using his platform to speak out against this. Me too. Uh, again, I've talked about this many times on the show, but uh, uh, seeing him kind of go through this process only helps more and more gay people out there realize that they can do it, too. Absolutely, um, or people who or other aren't people conceiving who are, naturally, yeah. you know. And, and that's the thing. It's like there's so much underlying homophobic, you know, uh, vibe that's going on with this and For it just sure. needs to be called out so people can see it and I'm glad he was the one to do it. Yeah and I do think that this is a case where I love seeing him get political yes. in this sort of instance and he's done a lot for this cause. I know he was uh campaigning hard for the bill to pass here in oh, New yeah, York. Oh yeah, we saw State. Cuomo. It was a whole thing, but yeah. uh, hopefully in the future he can make big waves because he's been through it and uh I know the process that he went through and it 
it's time other people get to have that happiness well, I too. I can't wait to hear about it more. At number two, fans of Zoe Deschanel's She and Him show were treated to a special Property Brothers cameo on Wednesday night. The actress brought her boyfriend Jonathan Scott on stage as the very She and Him Christmas party tour kicked off in Philadelphia. A source tells people that it's no surprise that the reality star is supporting his lady as the couple bonded earlier in their relationship over their shared love of music. That's super It's a feel-good story, isn't it? Do you think he showed up to that stage, though, and was like, we can change this around Oh, yeah, he was bit. totally like feng shuang the whole thing. <laughs> He's like, mics need to go there, lights up here, right? I mean, like... But I love this, and now I want to see her start showing up to his job. Come over to the Brady house. Like, do... Could you imagine? Yeah, she's floor. like, I'm going to knock down this closet. Why not? Yeah, we could do it. I think they're an adorable couple. They're very attractive together. Well... Yeah. Well, yeah. Look how cute they are. They are very adorable. I hope Not as cute as us, but they'll get there. They'll uh, get hopefully. there. <laughs> At number one, Robbie Hayes is joining yet another reality TV show. People can confirm that Hayes has officially joined season three of MTV's Siesta Key. The casting news might not come as a huge surprise to devoted fans who know Hayes has briefly romantically linked to Siesta Key star Juliet Porter. Robbie made his reality TV debut as the runner-up on JoJo Fletcher's season of The Bachelorette in 2016 and later returned for twin stints on Bachelor in Paradise. Robbie also previously sparked romance rumors last year with Vanderpump Rules star Sheena Marie, who told people that he ghosted her. The new season of Siesta the key premieres January 7th on MTV and Reality Check. We'll have not one, but four cast members from the series here ahead of the premiere. Wow. Are you excited? Do you know who Robbie is? Have you not well, seen yeah, Machina Marie? That's stuff? pretty intense, right? Yeah. So The Bachelorette, two stints on The Bachelor, Vanderpump Rules, now Siesta Key. That's that's real good for him. Oh yeah, I mean at first I think you can say, is he in it for love or is he in it for fame? And I feel like we know Maybe the answer. Maybe a little bit of fame at this point. A but little bit? Yeah. yeah sure. <laughs> what but. reality show do you think he should go on after Siesta Key? Probably um, the challenge, right? Because that's all the oh same. Oh my God. Work. The thing is, is like he has the body and the physique to do the challenge, but I would like to see him on there because I think he would get his ego in check. For do the sure. challenge next, maybe. We'll see him on Nailed It after that. The, the possibilities are endless. The possibilities are endless. <laughs> By the way, did you hear any more gossip about the Sheena story? I feel like you know more about... I mean, I know always a little bit too much about this sort of did thing. Did he really ghost her? Yeah, he ghosted her. Like, after one According date? To or, Sheena. Do we know how many dates that they went on? Well, with Sheena, you never really know how many dates. Because, like, right. it could be one thing where it was, like, she, she tends to be somebody, and she's very open about this, that she jumps into things. Yes. So what you and I would consider a date may not be a date to her, right? It may be two or three dates to her but right. she said that it was uh, very early on is there any her. appropriate time where you can ghost no i think that it's 2019 we can all be honest with one another and not hurt each other's feelings there's a very appropriate way to just say to somebody listen i'm gonna move on yeah do you mind it's scary is it really why I just be honest i mean with it's not feelings. scary to me i wouldn't want to be ghosted either but like i understand what people are like oh i don't want to hurt their feelings i'm like we well, don't owe to me you don't owe anyone anything if you've never met them but once you've gone on one date you yeah. should be able to at least say something hey listen it text. was a, con a connection but i wish you the best of luck i don't know i don't like having all those skeletons behind me right i like to kind of, of course having clean bridges and open doors you'll you be receiving know. a text from me later sweet. are you breaking up with me I, uh, we have to go to break when we come back we're talking to everyone's favorite skeleton stay tuned Here to perform Unmasked, once and for all, the artist formerly known as the Skeleton. One, two, three, take your hand and come with me, because you look so <laughs> Welcome back. On the line now is the artist briefly and formally known as the Skeleton, the legendary Paul Schaefer. Hey, how are you, Paul? Well, I'm I'm fabulous. I, I like the legendary part. <laughs> hit that hard, hit that, leave the briefly. Leave that alone. Well, listen. <laughs> Sorry about that, but I, my run was brief but uh, memorable. Very memorable. You're a legend in your own right, with or without the skeleton costume. But I want to start I, off. I, I, thank you, though. <laughs> <laughs> I want to start off with you as the skeleton. It was seriously an incredible costume, maybe my favorite. Tell me a little bit about the experience of being on Masked Singer. The whole thing was bizarre, right from the from the get go. Uh, crazy. You know, uh, just getting the call was was ridiculous. I had seen the show in the first season. I knew what was going on. I knew that, you know, A, I'm, I'm no singer, uh, but the whole thing looks like such a blast. And it certainly didn't let me down. It was just as crazy. 
As far as the costume, you know, there was a meeting with wardrobe, and they showed me a couple of sketches, different things, an ice cream cone. Um, and I don't remember the third thing they saw, but when I saw the skeleton, I don't know. I said, yeah, let me, let me do that. <laughs> well, what, um, I, what I loved about you on the show so much, Paul, is that you performed quite a range of genres. Of course, knowing so much about music, you were perfect for that. What was your favorite genre to perform? Uh, yeah, well, I only got to do three numbers. Yeah. All of them were different. First one was Rapper's Delight, of course, you know, that classic uh, rap tune that I think Nick Cannon holds so near and dear. And that was a lot of fun for me, just because somehow way back then, in the 70s, 9 or whenever it came out, I learned it then, you know. So, yeah, there I was having a lot of fun. <laughs> I think by, uh, by the next, we, oh, and then there was a Smackdown, you know, and that was a song, uh, Otis Redding, you know, I could sing a little bit. As the show went on, I really realized, and as the, as the episodes went by, I really realized how underneath all of these costumes and crazy hats and masks, is it's a singing competition, isn't it? Yeah. And the people are really, you know, we hear, we're judging their voices. Not only the panel, but the kids in the audience too, you know? The people with amazing sound, you know? The sound of their voices is really what is coming through. So there's a lot of fun, though, to be in those first episodes. Oh, yeah, and you moved, you moved well in that skeleton costume, my friend. <laughs> Actually, Jenny was the first to guess correctly that it was you. Were you just freaking out behind your mask when she said your name? Um, your, when you, your first reaction is, damn, she got me, you know. Uh, yes, she did. And I, as I watch the episodes, I see she gets a lot of them. She's pretty perceptive. Um, I loved that first week, though, when Ken said, oh, I've studied Martin Short. I know this man's every move. He is my comedy idol. This is Martin Short. I thought that was hilarious because, of course, Marty, my best friend, you know, but it wasn't Martin Short. It was me. And Marty called me up, actually, and he said, I think you're the skeleton. And I said, I think you're the skeleton. <laughs> um, so, but, but, you know, once Jenny says, I know who it is, then it's almost like, oh, it's all over, it jiggers up. Well, let's talk about last night's Masked Singer when the butterfly was revealed. What did you think uh, when it turned out to be Michelle Williams? Was that your guess? Um, all I knew was uh, she sounds great and she is down. And I dug when she had gone into a kind of a stance, you know, just getting down and almost stomping each feet back and, and forth. She was deep. Uh, I was a big, you know, already digging her and couldn't imagine who it was going to be. And then when you see her, I guess my reaction was, oh, oh, no wonder, you know, that's why she was so good. <laughs> and she made a lot out of how she has taken a year off, didn't she? And it sounds like, gee, she had ish confidence issues. Man, she had nothing to worry about. She's so good, you know. I hope it is her big comeback. It was fantastic. Was, her unmasking, very emotional. Who was the most surprising reveal to you so far this season? Oh, uh, you know, uh, that's a good question. Certainly Dr. Drew. I never uh, would have thought that he could sing two lyrics. <laughs> you know? So I think I'm going to have to go with that. That's a great answer. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, let's get back to let's get back to you. I want to play a clip from one of your clue packages. Let's watch. Okay. That ever since childhood, I felt overshadowed. But then in my career, I realized that being in the background let me be more instrumental in orchestrating those around me. Now that I've had a taste of the spotlight, I'm holding on to it for dear life. And I'm dead serious. All right, well, do you code this for us a little bit? What does it mean to you to orchestrate from behind the scenes? Well, I guess, you know, that's probably literal because I had the band on the Letterman show and we, we were called the CBS Orchestra. And as such, you know, I'm not normally out front of an orchestra. I'm sort of leading it uh, from behind the scenes. That's what I thought. You know that they don't tell us what these clues are. There's an interview, they get some ideas for clues but you don't know uh, really what they're using and what they're not. 
there was a big controversy about the number of episodes. One of the clues on the gravestone, I think, the skeleton was in a graveyard, and on the gravestone there was a number, a four-digit number, and it turned out that was supposed to be the number of episodes that we did on Letterman. Well, I had no idea. I didn't know how many episodes we did. But there's a guy, Don Giller, who knows everything, uh, and he started calling and complaining. No one's calling me. You know, I know the number, but apparently it was a mistake. And But I had no idea, nor do I know anything about this, this clue. Who's that? That's me and Letterman. Look, he's cutting. I'm getting hit, as I often did, by sandbags and falling off uh, the New York City cab. The best. I'm the nostalgic now in my head for, I'm nostalgic for some Excedrin uh, migraine. <laughs> I, the absolute best, one of my favorite duos in late night. But I want to talk about your own show that you have on AXS TV called Paul Schaefer Plus One. Tell me a little bit about that project. I had so much fun doing it uh, for Axis. Uh, and and the, uh, the, the audio version appears and our versions appear on Sirius XM too. Paul Schaefer Plus One. You can see there's a clip, that, which is like in the studio, but I have guests. I had everybody from... Joe Walsh, there he is right there. Martin Short was my last guest, but mostly they were uh, classic rock serious performers like uh, like Billy Gibbons from ZZ Top and, my goodness, uh, Sammy Hagar, you know, and uh, Donald Fagan, who is, uh, you know, you, nobody can get him, but he came and did this. And we talked music, and, you know, he demonstrate, he's demonstrating there how he wrote Life in the Fast Lane, you know, and I'm saying... I'm thinking about the money that his accountant raked in, you know, <laughs> as he plays those notes. That's what I'm thinking about, too, Paul. I'm thinking about yeah. the, the, the zeros at the end of that bank account yeah. for that song. Yeah. All, right. All right, listen, we got to take a quick break, but we're going to keep on chatting with Mr. Paul Schaefer when we return. Stay tuned. Yeah. I had a little choreography last week doing it, you know, and I think I was doing a little of this too. Not inhibiting at all. I asked them, will I be able to dance in these? They said, absolutely. I said, great, because I couldn't dance before. <laughs> always a jokester. Welcome back. We're still chatting with the always funny, the very talented, and he sometimes dances, Paul Schaefer. Yes. Hey, how are you, Paul? <laughs> Good to be back with you. That was a joke from about 1945. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, fun to reminisce about The Masked Singer. It was a nutty experience. Well, I want to ask you about another nutty thing, because legend has it that you were almost cast as George Costanza in Seinfeld, but you didn't return Jerry Seinfeld's call. Is this true? Yes, well, let me, uh, let, me, let me just clear up. It, it wasn't that it was George. You know, this was early in the development of the Seinfeld show. I don't know if they had a George or a, an, an Elaine or what, but they, I got a message at work that said, Jerry wants you to be his sidekick on a show he's getting as a pilot. And, and not, you know, not he wants you to be a, a character named Costanza, whatever, you know, maybe there would have been a whole group, maybe it was just one guy at that point. Who knows? And I just looked at it and said, Jerry Seinfeld, what kind of show would he possibly have? And, uh, and I didn't have that time. I had no assistant or any buddy to return calls for me and I just didn't I said you know this will never amount to anything and of course it amounted to the bit most uh, beloved show in the history of broadcasting but that's just the smarts you know that a guy like me has you seem too smart to be uh, George Costanza let me just say that coming from a, as a big Seinfeld fan my own family my own family heard the story and uh, you know about oh you would and they said you wouldn't have been as good yeah so <laughs> They know, a person's family knows. You're too smart and talented, but despite not being in Seinfeld, you've skillfully combined your talent in music and comedy over decades, working with so many interesting, so many talented people. So that being said, let's do it. It's time to play a game I'm calling Cast on Blast. All right, Paul, we're going to list off some people you've worked with, and we'd love for you to tell us a funny story about them or maybe something we don't know about them, something memorable that might have happened off camera, just to give us a little gossip, all right? All right, okay. Uh, all right, let's start with the obvious. Am I, am I under oath? You are under oath. We are. This is by law now. We have this recording. All right, but go ahead. All right, let's start with the obvious. You've worked with him on both Late Night and The Late Show, David Letterman. Uh, just that he... 
said to me, you know, when I was just trying to find my way on the show and, oh, trying to, you know, maybe get in a, a line here and there, maybe get a laugh, you know. Uh, but, of course, I don't know. For some reason, he trusted me enough to say, if you have anything, jump in. I don't care if I'm in the middle of an interview with Julia Roberts. Just jump in and say, you know, well, how many bosses would say that? I, I never forgot it. And, of course, I... I took advantage of it and tried not to abuse it. But, he, you know, what a, a fabulous guy to work for. Do you have a, a most memorable guest who you worked with when you were on the show? Well, I'm always, you know, being the band leader, I'm always going to go for the music, of course. And I'm James Brown, oh. the godfather of soul. I'll always remember his first appearance, especially back in 1982. I never, I, mean, I still haven't recovered from it. Wow. The best, the absolute best. I, I got to ask, this is an important follow-up, the most important follow-up. What do you think of Letterman's beard? Well, <clears throat> do you know that the beard has its own agent now? <laughs> That's number one. Uh, but secondly, uh, you've got to know that the more people talk about it, complain about it, the longer he's going to grow it. Amen. And, I, yep. and I'm good with that. I'm good with it, too. Yeah, he's 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 a potster. <laughs> All right, what about Bill Murray? Uh, a wonderful friend who uh, said to me uh, way back, I don't know, this goes back so many years, just this conversation, said, you should write a book. And I ended up taking his advice and writing a book. But he actually took me, he said, it's easy. Let's just go out for dinner. And he took me, like, for lunch at Sardi's and put a cassette recorder, that's how long ago it was, on, and press play and said, just tell stories into this. That's how, you know, and he encouraged me to write that book, which I did write. I mean, that's absolutely incredible. I, I yeah. it seems like such a good guy, you know, it seems incredible. I, I agree, and you couldn't get anybody funnier, and we go back to, uh, you know, working for the National Lampoon comedy magazine in their radio hour in about 1974, I think, and, and he sang Kung Fu Christmas, a <laughs> song that we wrote, a seasonal song at that time. Yeah, and then you guys did the very Murray Christmas together. So what were your memories of working you on that? that? Well, uh, you know, the first thing that comes to mind is how great Miley Cyrus was as a guest who uh, was game for anything, and wanted, loved that she was going to get to sing live as well as, you know, do some lip syncing when it was old fashioned style special. Uh, and oh, there's a little yes. I think this is from it. And then uh, somebody dropped out. We needed another song. And she said, I'll do something. And I just, she just kind of perched up on the piano and sang, I think, Silent Night, a kind of country gospel style. Fantastic. No rehearsal. And Billy is just so great to be around at any time. Wow, Paul, I, we knew we would come to you for the best stories ever. You are a legend in your own right, but certainly the most legendary skeleton ever. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining Reality Check. Hey, Thank you very much. Fun being with both of you guys, Darren and Dave. Thank you so much. All right, fun to be here. I can't Thanks, believe Paul. you just said my name. Catch the Masked Singer Wednesday nights at 8, 7 Central on Fox. Also check out Paul Schaefer Plus One on Access TV and XM Radio. Dave, thank you as always for being here with me. You are the best as always. <laughs> Stay tuned after the break. I'm talking with bad babe Ashley Brooke of The Challenge. Stay tuned. That's correct, you win. 30 seconds at the most, Lee, and this was a piece of cake. If she thought she was gonna beat me, she had another thing coming. I peed myself on the way up. Welcome back to the show. I've got not only a two-time challenge champ, Ashley Brooke Mitchell with me, but she's a credible puzzler. Ashley, how's it going? It's awesome. How are you? I'm in an airport, so I'm doing my best just to talk to you today. I'm really excited to be here. Well, thank you for being here. We really appreciate <laughs> it. You're on the go. Now, Ashley, before I get into last night's episode, I have to take it back to that clip from last week where you were thrown into elimination that no one but viewers were able to see. Were you worried when you got lost on the trail that you would be the one going home? That was a very dire moment. Okay, first of all, I got lost twice, and these weren't like quick like I was lost for five to ten minutes I was screaming I was cussing I'm like I can hear the drums I'm cursing at them 
Oh my, you see me at one point, I flip off the cameraman because I was like, I know y'all saw me go the wrong way and you just let me go. I was heated and scared and, and I just, I knew I couldn't quit though. No, you, you never give up. I mean, you're, you're a puzzle queen. Did you actually pee on your, on the trail when you were, when you were there? Well, yeah, because I was ahead of Nani by a lot. And then when I got lost, I knew I didn't have a second. I did not have a second to wait. I didn't have time to get Papa smart at these days. So, honey, I just let it go and because I knew I didn't have a second to waste. It's all about the challenge, really baby. Good. Well, you're a two-time. It's all about the money. <laughs> it's all about that money. You're a two-time champ. I mean, do you still feel that people view you as an underdog? You've won twice. No, you know, I really felt like that coming into this season because I keep a diary and I'm like, I don't know. I'm one of the weakest girls, I think, but I'm just going to keep my head up. And then all season long, people like Jordan and Tori, they, once we switched, once we switched teams or they switched teams, they were like, Ashley's the strongest one on the Americans. And Zach was always giving me props. So this season, I kind of like was surprised by how much people were giving me like the credit that I finally deserve, I feel like. Yeah, this season feels different than all the others. The alliances that were formed have been crazy. I actually want to jump into last night's episode where it seemed like all the hard work your alliance put in started to essentially unravel as we saw Polly just flame out when your team needed him the most. Let's take a look. My body is completely dead. And I can barely breathe at this point. I'm a little worried because right now, I'm dead weight. My whole body's crazy. Come on, guys. Go. Oh. I mean, Paulie can talk the talk, but he cannot walk the walk. Earlier in the episode, he said that he felt was at peak performance. In fact, he hammered it in to everyone. What was that like to see yeah. him in this moment? Well, I mean... I'm not good with partners, like, so I've, I've always said what I'm thinking. So, of course, y'all know me. I couldn't help but just yell at everyone, and I didn't know what to do because I'd never seen him like that. You can't help when you get overheated and you get heat stroke, and maybe we just didn't drink enough water. We didn't think the final was going to start the next day. Like, I literally did my elimination the night before, so we just weren't prepared, and having the numbers didn't help us. It actually hurt us, and that was something I was not prepared for, so... Do you feel ba bad a little bit about how you acted? I mean, even when Polly was like flaming out, you were just kind of like, we got to go. Let's move. Honey, it's $4 million. He's lucky I didn't grab him by his hair and just pull him down <laughs> the jungle because, I mean, I don't feel bad. And they know me. Like, they know I'm a talker. They know in the middle of the competition, I can't control my emotions. So, I mean, once they like kind of yelled at me, like, there's nothing we can do, I backed off a little bit. I understood what was going on. But, honey, at first I was about to kick him in the side and be like, come on, let's go. Leave your boyfriend in the jungle to die. He's gone. He's, he's a victim of the challenge. <laughs> I mean, I love it. You are no BS this season. I actually want to take it back to earlier in the episode where Cara Maria started to break down during the math checkpoint. I, I had to laugh, but let's take, let's take a look at it. Concentrate, Cara. Cara, it's okay. Cara. Minus the eights and six. Negative six. This is your ninth final and you're crying over a math problem. What's going on? I'm so mad at her right now, honestly, I could spit. I mean, she even freaked out during the eating challenge. What was it like to watch a nine time finalist and someone from your alliance crack under the pressure like this? I don't know. And she's someone I've always looked up to in the challenge because she's like a for real badass. And like, I love the female empowerment. Like. There's no way you can't give her credit for everything she's accomplished. I don't know what really happened to her. I feel like Polly was breaking down and she had more pressure. I think having Polly around makes her like a little more nervous sometimes, but I've never ran a final with her before. So this time I was like, this is not the Cara that I've seen on TV. So I don't know. I was honestly flabbergasted and honey, I was just stressed. I'm thinking, Oh my Lord. I, cause I know that, you know, the first day of a, uh, the final is not the last and I'd rather be in second place on the first day to give myself a little bit of like fire under my butt yeah but so I still was being pretty positive all the way up so I mean listen I wouldn't want to eat like a live maggot worm whatever was going on either but she's been in the final nine times so I was a little a little shocked actually that's all I'm gonna say a yeah shocked. I Honey, once I get to the final and there's an eating challenge, I'm thinking, hell, I haven't ate anything else all day. 
and and I don't know what it is. I kind of black out because when I sit watch it on TV, I'm gagging. I'm like, oh, oh, like I can't even watch it. But I don't know when it comes down time for it, honey. I'll do just about anything TJ tells me to in that final. <laughs> Well, listen, it's for a million dollars. I actually want to talk about it because Zach constantly talked about Ninja being the weakest player on Team USA. I mean, he talked about it all season long. But after seeing the way Cara Maria was during both the math and eating checkpoint, do you think maybe you formed your alliance with the wrong people? Yeah. See, listen, I came into this season all alone. So the first person, people that threw me a bone, I was going to hop onto it like a present on Christmas morning because I was – I had nothing. I had nothing. So I was in the room with them, and they kind of just – Polly just kind of pulled me to a side one day, and it's like, if we vote this way, we can all work together. And I'm like, oh, thank you, Jesus, because I was just floating until someone grabbed me. Now, Jordan and Tori had both came up to me multiple times throughout the season and asked me to work with them too. So I had already formed this alliance. And no matter what people say about the whole Hunter thing, I'm actually very loyal to my alliances. So – I felt bad, like, turning my back on these people. And I was also making friends with them. So it's like, right. would it have been smarter for me to team up with Tori, Jordan, and Zach? Obviously. Okay, but, that's I mean, what I thought. I knew you were going to say that. I knew it. Well, you know. But, you know, I don't regret it. I don't regret it, honestly. Because, I mean, that, they don't show the just us sitting around laughing, talking about, like, the bad things in our past, the good things in our future. So, I mean, we really did become close. It's not just all competitions and drinking and things like that well let, listen i mean the drinking is also fun too i'm not gonna lie i mean you guys <laughs> you guys have set yourself up for a, a number of different challenges moving forward which i'm so excited about but speaking of ninja previously she was on our show here a few weeks ago and she actually left you a message let's take a look oh god it's Natalie here, AKA Ninja. And just between us, if you could choose one person to be in your alliance that wasn't this season, who would it be? Who's your pick, Ashley? Who's your pick? Gotta be honest. Oh, who would I pick to be in my alliance? Yeah, who wasn't already, oh, yeah. Go oh gosh. Um, I wouldn't say really anyone because I didn't really get on with anyone that much. We didn't really get along, but I mean, Obviously, Zach, but he was a floater anyway, so maybe Jordan, because Jordan is just so good, but he's hard to work with in a team. He's very, like, a little judgmental and always watching what you're doing. Like, so, I don't know. I like our alliance the way it was. <laughs> I don't know who I want to pick. A lot of a lot of people would say that, you know, this, this season was really about the numbers and you guys playing sort of a scared game, or at least Polly and Kara playing a scared game. Do you think... I don't think it's a scared game. It's a smart game. TJ always used to say... Don't the way to make it to a final is don't go to elimination, now, honey. If I never had to see the elimination floor, I'll shake hands with the devil because I hate the elimination floor. So, fair enough. But you know that with the numbers, you sort of turned Jordan into an underdog, and I don't think anyone sort of thought that Jordan was an underdog going into it. Do you? Do you? I mean, do you uh, regret that a little bit? Well, I mean, a little bit because, I mean. From our point of view, he was the villain, and that's what I say in everyone's story. You're the villain in somebody's story. That's just the way the world is. And so even though he was the villain in our story, it comes to find out when these episodes get edited, he's the kind of like the hero or the underdog. So, I mean, I actually get on with him and Tori, so I think he's a great competitor. But we definitely gave him a lot of air time. <laughs> oh, yeah, you did. Well, even though Team USA wasn't having an easy time, it wasn't smooth sailing for Team UK either. They actually had a 10-minute penalty stop down. What was going on? I mean, I've never seen T CTB so aggressive, at least not recently. Um, yeah, I don't know what was going on either. It, see, I was telling my team I like to stay in the second – on these long runs, I like to stay close to the person in the lead because you're letting them set the pace and tiring out. But we've got a lot of guys with big egos on both teams. So Polly wasn't letting them pass. They didn't want to be in second place. So it was like a literal war in the jungle. That's not a joke. There was not enough room for both of these. I'm like – I got my head smashed into a tree. So – they it do, was wild out there. They do not play. Well, we told the Twitterverse that you would be here today, and one user had a question Gosh. about who some might call the unsung hero of Team USA. At Too Bad to Bougie wants to know, how big of an asset was Leroy in the final? Okay, well, this is another thing. Leroy's the only boy 
who carried that thing the whole time so far. So, I mean, at this point, I think Zach has only carried it once or once and a half times. Um, the other boys on the UK team, they carried it the whole time thus far. So Leroy is the only guy who really stood up to the plate. And, you know, people called him, like, the little engine that could. Or, like, you know, some people all in the house always have slick stuff to say. But Leroy literally was. He kept the composure. He kept the positivity. And, I mean, I just love Leroy as a friend, as a brother, and as a competitor. He's, he's, he's a good guy. As of right now where we are in the finale, based on performance alone, in your opinion, excluding you, who do you think should win the challenge? Oh goodness! Like, which team, or do you think which people? Which people? I mean, I mean, obviously, obviously me because I'm like the funniest competitor. I'm the hardest working. <laughs> no, I'm just. <laughs> but, I agree. Uh, I agree. <laughs> I really want Cam and Leroy to get their first win. Yeah. I also want Tori to get her first win. I love people getting their first win, and I gotta tell you, I mean, Jordan is probably one of the best people to ever play this game. I've never seen someone compete like him. He doesn't just use like his endurance. He has a lot of brain by the, he works hard or works easy, not harder. So, I mean, I don't think there's anybody that's in this final that doesn't deserve it. In my opinion, I think if y'all saw how much we trained, I've never seen a challenge house where people were training all day long, every day swimming. Like we were all here for the money. This wasn't we weren't partying. We weren't getting blackout drunk like they do in some seasons. We were here for the money, and that's the truth. Yeah, I mean, you have to be a true athlete to go on the challenge. It is no joke. We have to take a, I know. We have to take a quick break, but Ashley is sticking around for more. Don't go anywhere. I've said that car. Come on, you're a nine time finalist. There's no reason you should be crying over stuff like this. You've ate worse. Once again, car is crying because she has to eat something. Like, we have to make up time. The Brits are ahead of us. Shut up and do work. Oh my God, I love Ashley so much. Welcome back to the show. I'm still here with Ashley from MTV's The Challenge. Ashley, how are you holding up? I just love your attitude this season. It's so good. Uh, I think I've pretty much always had the same attitude. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. I've been trying to control myself a little bit more, like with fighting and yelling at people. But when it comes time for a final, I'd fight my own grandma if her butt wasn't moving along fast enough. Well, I was going to say, it almost seems like you've settled into yourself a little bit. Like, you're still like a firecracker, but you're not going off the rails this year. Like, you're telling everyone exactly how it is. And that's why I love you. You're unapologetically yourself. Well, that's the thing with, like, reality TV. Although, you know, there's a lot of bad parts. You get to watch yourself and at least try to learn and better who you are because... I mean, it's hard to, like, judge yourself until you watch yourself on TV and you're like, damn, my voice is annoying. Damn, I need to use a little better highlighter. And I probably should control my anger a little bit better. So <laughs> Fair enough. it's a blessing in disguise. It makes good TV. But, Ashley, since it's your first time here, I got to give your own little challenge and put you in the hot seat with a game I like to call Cast on Blast. <laughs> oh, Lord. All right, Ashley, here's how it works. It's pretty straightforward. I'm going to name some of your castmates, and I want you to tell me a strength and a weakness about them, okay? Be honest, which I feel like you could absolutely do, but don't hold back. I know. Are, are you ready? I'm such a sh talker. Let's go. <laughs> Let's start with CT, Papa Bear. Um, he is a major floater. Um, that's his weakness because it's starting to become pretty obvious after a couple of seasons. His strength is that he's a train and he just will never stop. It doesn't matter. He goes, goes, goes. And I don't know. He's getting old, but he, his body's only getting younger. Amen to that. How about Killa Cam? Killa Cam. She can be standoffish when you first meet her. And that's why I think in her first few seasons, she went into so many eliminations because she seems a little like reserved or standoffish. But once you get to know her, she's a sweetie. Um, and she is just a beast in that elimination floor. Like that girl, I would not want to see her on a killing floor, on a proving floor. Keep me out of the ring. <laughs> yeah, she. I would not want to go against Killer Cam. What about Leroy? <laughs> Leroy, his weakness is a, he's a horrible swimmer, and he might be even worse at puzzles. So that's why he likes having me on his team because I'm great at both. And the positives about Leroy is that everyone gets along with him. Um, he has great endurance, and he has um, he has good strength. He seems like just the sweetest guy. Is that right? He seems he, just... really, he has everyone laughing. Like, I don't know why his jokes don't get so more, but he is like the comedian of the house. He always has us cracking up. Oh, I love that. What about Ninja Natalie? 
Her weakness is obviously swimming, but she got much better than that. Um, she's very strong-minded, which can be a weakness and a positive. I mean, she was a doctor. This girl's genius, but sometimes when she's set in her ways, you kind of really have to talk to her before she'll listen to your side. And her strength is that she's got endurance for days, and she's probably even better than puzzles than me. She's a genius, so that's why I love the girl. When she eliminated Laurel in that competition at the beginning of the season, and Laurel thought she won, greatest moment in TV. I love so, it. Every moment. So much drama. Um, what about Cara Maria? Um, Cara's weakness is her emotions. She gets like she gets emotionally hurt from the show a little bit, or people say her name, or and her strength is just she's an overall really good player. I mean, she's good at puzzles. She's good at endurance. Um, I don't know. Polly might be her weakness. We'll have to see in the future. I'm not sure. Interesting. Okay. <laughs> what about Tori? Tori, um, her weakness is puzzles and. Oh God, Tori doesn't have much weakness. This girl is a beast. Like, she really is. She's smart. She's strong. She has endurance, but mostly she works her butt off. Like, I don't think it came natural to her. Like, she really works hard, and I gotta give her respect for that. All the females could kick all the guys' asses this season, right? Like, I think so. Killing it, Ashley. I love it. Uh, what about <laughs> what about Polly? Polly, his weakness is definitely his ego. Um, I think it makes him like say things sometimes that is that you don't I wouldn't see because I see him as such a kind and like a brother. He was so like took care of me all season, but he can come off as a little cocky. Um, but he's a really smart too. I don't know if y'all have seen him. He's killed the puzzles this season. He has endurance for days. He's good at swimming. Like I have no idea why he gassed out so early in this um final dude. I just don't understand. I don't know either. It made for such good TV though. What about uh for Zach? Zach, well his weakness is that he's kind of a dick to everybody. Um I actually find him really funny. But um yeah, I don't know. That has to be his only weakness because that boy's pretty good at everything too. He's just naturally really athletic and I mean there's not I'm sorry, but the people in the final this season, there is not much of weakness to them besides like D is a crybaby for love. Rogan is a man whore. Uh, <laughs> like, Zach is a jerk. Like, that's it. <laughs> are Zach and Jenna still together? Yes, they are. I love that. She's stuck. And they're very happy. She's stuck by him. I, I'm into it. Last up, we have Jordan for you. What's his weakness and his strength? His weakness is definitely that he's super cocky. I mean, he has a reason to be. But, like, and he's also kind of, like, always judging others are like, well, you know, that, that final had a lot of puzzles. That's what she won. Or did you see how bad they did in the swim? I mean, I don't know if that's really a weakness or just like more of a personality flaw, but that's another one. Like now I have conversations with Jordan. He's a really smart guy. He's very business minded and I love to talk to him. So I don't hate him. That's the problem. I don't hate anybody. I need to start hating people more. <laughs> yeah. You, but, um, need, you need to start hating people more for sure. I just, I truly do get along and I respect all of these competitors so freaking much. But um, Jordan, his strength is pretty much freaking everything. I mean, I mean, he's like the poster child for this show. He's really good. He really is good. Ashley, you are the richest challenge champion that has ever lived. Thank you so much for joining <laughs> us today. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you having me on here. It's like a dream. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Ashley. Everybody, make sure you catch the epic season finale of the challenge war of the world's two wednesday night on mtv when we come back we're going back in time for another moment in reality tv history well that's it for today big thanks to paul schaefer and ashley for being excellent guests and of course big thanks to dave quinn Make sure you're following at people on Twitter so you can get the latest episode of Reality Check, which streams Monday through Thursday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern. To end the show and our first week of December, here's a moment in reality history that'll have you chanting, kiss the girl. I'm Darren Karp, and that was your Reality Check. My name's Josh, and I'm back to try this again. I hope I can redeem myself. I hope I can actually meet an incredible girl today and make it love at second kiss, definitely. In this 2016 episode of Love at First Kiss, Josh gets another shot and is hoping his second first kiss is better than the first one. 
I'm about to kiss a total stranger. I'm hoping that he's a really great kisser for sure. Maybe this will be the magic I'm looking for. Emily seems game, but Josh seems nervous. <laughs> um, can I kiss you? Sure. Then panics, goes for the cheek, and beelines backstage. I don't know. <laughs> I screwed up. I feel like something traumatic just happened to me, and you like don't know how to respond. Josh's cheeky blunder is one of the great moments in reality history. But don't worry, he later found love at first kiss with Roxanne and eventually proposed. It was awesome. <laughs>